Bacha. I'm the President and CEO of the San Antonio Housing Authority. And the first thing I want to say is thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to come spend the, you know, an hour and a half, two hours with us tonight to talk about a project that we've been discussing for a couple of years now. So um, I just want to say on behalf of my board, and I think I believe uh, Commissioner Clack is here. He's in the back of the room. I want to acknowledge one of my bosses. Uh, on behalf of my board, myself, and about the 500 employees that work at San Antonio Housing Authority, again, I want to say thank you and gracias for coming. Uh, we have an agenda that we'll go through, but I just want to give a couple of remarks before we get into the agenda. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that as a housing authority, we're very pleased and happy to be working with the community to have a new development come to the near west side. A community that, that has not had investment uh, by the housing authority in generations, by, by many other people in generations as well. Uh, a development that, and we'll get into the specifics later, that will bring, bring the new uh, first affordable housing and public housing back to this community in 80 years. Uh, so we're very proud of that. I think we recognize the cultural history of the community and we're very sensitive to that. And we want to honor that. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the way we honor the past is to go ahead and ensure that the people who live here currently have a better future. All right? And to some of us, what that means is modern amenities in the building, such as potentially washer and dryers, air conditioning, as connectivity, because we all know everybody has one of these devices now, and a lot of people don't have laptops or they don't have uh, desktops, and we can provide connectivity. Everything's going towards that world. So I just want you to know that we're very appreciative of the outcome in regards to the number of people here tonight. We're here to listen, we're here to engage, we're here to have a conversation. Um, and uh, again, I'm just very appreciative of you, you taking the time to be here. Uh, what I want to do is, uh, I don't know if someone's got this presentation, but uh, I think we're going to invite Adrian Lopez up next. Adrian's our, uh, just uh, to identify some of the Saha staff that's in the room, Adrian Lopez is our Director of Community Development Initiatives. A lot of you know Adrian, his group works with Family Self Sufficiency, Jobs Plus. He actually, you know, we're talking about sticks and bricks tonight, but more importantly, it's flesh and blood. It's people that we're going to be talking about and impacting their lives in a positive way. ABA's department works in that regard. Uh, we also have Lorraine Robles is here somewhere. I saw Lorraine. She's in the back of the room. She's our Director of Development Services, Neighborhood Revitalization. She's in charge of the group that's been working on this project. I think I saw in the back Tim Alcott is here as well. He's the gentleman in the glasses. He's in charge of our legal team and also mostly our development team as well. So. Uh, and then we've got Michael in the back, and many other uh, Saha employees, David Costa, Bernie, and if I miss you, I, I apologize. But we want to bring Adrian up to talk a little bit about uh, this afternoon, and then we'll get into the majority of the agenda, all right? So um, we'll take questions when it's appropriate in regards to the presentation, and we'll go from there. So thank you again. Thank you, David. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, happy to be here. I just want to take a real quick moment to recognize uh, the residents. So those of you who are residents from Alasan, raise up your hand. And thank you specifically for coming here. You know, earlier today we had um, a, a leadership training. We have uh, thir uh, up to what is it, 25 resident councils throughout our communities that represent uh, nearly half of our public housing uh, units, right? So these are folks that we bring on a, on a quarterly basis to provide some training because they're the representatives of each of their communities, right? Um, you know, one of the things that um, we're very proud of in the work that we do is that not only do we provide housing, right, but we provide a lot of programs to actually help people springboard to the next level. Uh, last year, actually, David was mentioning our family self-sufficiency program. Last year, we had uh, just a little over, or almost 30 graduates uh, who graduated from, from FSS. In fact, Zandra, if you can raise your hand. Zandra the, is a case manager here. Um, and last year, we uh, awarded, not only did they graduate from, from, from FSS, right, but we awarded up back almost, or actually a, a little less than $200,000, right? This is money that these people earned, that, you know, spent the time with us here, that they're using to buy a car, to go buy a home, to do, you know, to move on to the, to the, to the next level, right? 
So we do our job right, obviously, as case managers and as and as staff with you know with the community development initiatives. But our job is only you know takes it so far, right? If it wasn't for our residents and our resident leadership that take on the positions to take on you know um, you know programs and, and the outreach and the engagement, then we wouldn't have that success, right? And there's many many more sort of examples of success uh, that you know we have throughout you know the housing authority. Uh, through residents, right? And, and if it's one thing that I've learned from this particular agency, having worked with the city of San Antonio for almost 10 years, having worked for uh, county government, having worked for a council of government, and for uh, nonprofits, is that the thing, the best thing that, that Saha has taught me is that the work that we do is we always do it through the lens of residents, right? And what's in the best interest for our residents. So, having said that, uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about today, given the amount of, of, of folks that we actually have here today, we want to hear everybody's input. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that um, you know, we, we hear what, what your, your support is, or your concerns, or, or those types of things. Uh, but given the size of the group, uh, you know, I was asked to see if we can sort of limit the amount of, of, of time that people speak. So we want to be respectful of everybody's particular time. But we certainly don't want to be here to all the way to midnight, right, given the size of, size of the group. So there is, a, I believe, uh, a sign-in sheet. Um, if, if, if you signed in uh, to speak, you would, you would have uh, upwards uh, up to three minutes, uh, just like we have at, uh, I believe, our city council meetings as well as at uh, our Saha board meetings um, to, to speak, right? So you have the opportunity. So we want to be respectful again of everybody's time. So the other kind of rules, and the reason I'm sort of going to hand this off to Janet is again, this is about resident empowerment. This is about sort of putting our residents front and center. And some of the things that we cover, for example, in the resident training that we were providing earlier, is talk about things like how do we respect each other? How do we sort of engage each other without sort of, you know, having, you know, a, a bad discourse? and positive dialogue. So Janet is going to talk a little bit about the rules. Thank you so much. Um, first and foremost, I want to introduce myself. My name is Janet Garcia. I'm the Vice President here for the Amazon Apache Resident Council. And I want to welcome you guys to my home. Um, I do want to go over some housekeeping rules. Um, I want to uh, uh, please to be considered when someone else is, in, is speaking. Um, please be considered and give you the chance for other people to speak. Don't speak over them, just be respectful. And we all could agree to disagree. And I want to uh, thank you for uh, being here today. And I want to welcome you humbly to our home. And um, thank you. Now, let's give a big round of applause to Janet. That's a lot of courage. I think when Janet first came to us, uh, she told me, I don't like public speaking, I don't like being in front of people. And so she's grown a lot. And so, you know, for our families, even taking that small step is a huge, huge thing, right? And they're doing it in front of their neighbors and their families and, and their friends. So, so again, I, I appreciate her, her coming. So I think, Lorraine, are you next? Okay. Good evening, I'm Lorraine De Robles. Welcome back. Uh, we've got a lot of great, uh, exciting, and interesting news for you this evening. Um, we have been planning the revitalization of Alazan in this neighborhood for over two years. And I wanted to let you know that um, Saha and NRP submitted the 9% tax credit uh, application, the full application, in March, in fact, March 1st. So you remember all the work that we did towards getting this all together. And again, this is our second year in applying. We, we were unsuccessful in getting the tax credit awards last year. So we tried again this year. Uh, the Alazan Residents Community Partners, elected officials, Saha, uh, NRP, uh, we all came together in Maine because in Austin, at the Texas Department of Housing and Community Initiatives, our application, our tax credit application, was in danger of being terminated, which would have meant that we would have missed out on the funding. And so a group of, of the residents here um, committed to going with us to Austin for the day and went up to speak in support of the project. And I'm happy to tell you that on July 25th of this year, we were awarded our tax credits. But you went to the project. It was with much work, uh, 
from our partners and our residents and our staff and all of everyone in the community uh, being able to help support us and put this application together and bring the project forward. So I'm going to go over um, a little bit of what we've done and where we're headed. So again, just to refresh your memory, fiscal year uh, 2016, we went after a choice, never could find the grant, uh, we, but we did not receive it. Uh, in 2017, we went after our choice neighborhood implementation grant. Again, we did not receive funding for that. But we said, as you heard our CEO speak earlier, that we were committed to the revitalization of this particular neighborhood. So regardless, with or without choice, we were moving forward. So much so that Saha committed $1.2 million in acquiring property near Alizan Courts for this particular project. Committed. Didn't matter what, whether we got the choice grant or not. Um, 2019 now, we submitted our application. Um, on May 23rd, uh, as I mentioned, we had our meeting at TDHCA to defend the project, the Alizan Locks development. On July 16th, we went to zoning. Right now, those properties that we purchased are zoned MF33. What does that mean? That means that under city code, we can build up to four stories and have 33 uh, apartments per acre. What we did was ask that instead of MF33, that we're applying for IDZ, a change, IDZ3. The only difference in this zoning is that IDZ3 helps us relax the parking requirements. Okay? And, uh, in a moment, when Jason comes up, he's going to show you the site, and it's gonna sh he's going to show you the five blocks that are involved in this particular neighborhood or this development. And you're going to see it's a little difficult to, to construct and maneuver, but we found a way to do it. Um, on, again, I mentioned uh, in, on July 16th when we went to zoning, we were successful. Again, uh, the city was in support, the zoning commission was in support of the project, again, because it's already zoned for that. All we're doing is relaxing the parking. Uh, on July, uh, 25th, we got our award of tax credits. The important part now is August 22nd. August 22nd, we now, now that we got approval from zoning, we now have to go to city council to get final approval from the city council to change that zoning. And so we're asking you to come out in support of the project and support of the rezoning request. Uh, if all goes well, which we were praying that it does, uh, then we will start construction the summer of 2020. And so, as soon as the city council meeting is over, we're going to resume. We're going to resume our, our meetings for design. Uh, when we uh, met last, we were we told you we committed. Our architects committed to going back and looking at different designs and doing more research about the neighborhood uh, to bring you some options that you felt were were more uh, representative of this community. And so, we are committed to doing that. Uh, we start uh, construction in 2020, uh, summer 2020, and we should be completed by December 2021. And again, this is just the first step in the revitalization of Alice on uh, We wanted to make sure that we built off-site first. Uh, that was something that we heard in, the, in our planning sessions over the last two and a half years, uh, that we wanted to make sure that the residents of Alice had a place to go within the community, so if they so desired to stay within the community. And so again, this is just the first phase of a multi-phase redevelopment project. Now I'm going to call Jason up and he's going to go over that specific project details with you. Good evening everybody, my name is Jason. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you out here this evening. Um, I would like to go over a little bit about the development itself and then as soon as we're done with the development and some representative examples, I'm sure a lot of you all have some questions that you'd like to get to and then Lorraine and I can get there as well as um, I just wanted to let you know that besides uh, Mr. Alcott and some of the other people that Mr. Savachi had mentioned, uh, we also have our architects uh, here this evening, uh, Munoz Architects. So if there's some specific questions that you all have, we can also address that too. Uh, going to the proposed development, we're proposing on, on the, we'll get to the site plan in a minute, uh, 88 mixed income multifamily units of a mix of one, two, and three bedroom units. 
80 affordable units, half of which are public housing units. I know that has been a primary concern of various people in the neighborhood when we're talking about potential displacement. We want to make sure that at least half of the units are reserved for those who are currently living in the courts to be able to move over without any change whatsoever and, and be able to move from, from the courts to the um, Alas on lofts. And that's, by the way, Alas on lofts is something that we are, we are working on. We're looking for, for input further in, 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 in that name as well. Um, so there's also eight market rate units, and the total development will cost approximately $18 million. So that's the, a strong investment from the, from the state, uh, and that's what we had been seeking over the past couple of years, as Lorraine had said. Next slide, please. So we had, uh, we had originally submitted option A. That's, that's a little bit different from what had been submitted. There was not as much of the landscaping buffer. We had added some landscaping buffers to that. A tot lot, the community center, and building A would be a four-story building, with building B being a three-story building, both on opposite sides of South Colorado Street. And uh, the north side would be reserved for parking, with the upper left corner to an additional amenity for the neighborhood. We had discussed at one time it being a community, uh, community garden, but we don't, I mean, again, we want to get more input from everybody in the neighborhood before you fully decide on what that's going to be. Uh, so that is the option that was submitted to the state with a few changes after the zoning commission. However, we've been meeting with the neighborhood, including the historic west side and Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, and they have asked us to make, if we could, some other changes that we are still <coughs> next like this, uh, that we are still trying to vet out, and we think we're going to be able to do this, but we are meeting with the city. We have a commitment to do this provided that the, the city will, will, will allow us to do so. And that is taking the four-story building and tearing it down to three-story as it goes into the neighborhood. And then moving uh, these two buildings right here, putting a building up here, and then moving that this three-story building down to a two-story. So it'd still be the same amount of units. Uh, and it would just have, we would be tearing it down to a three, four-story building, a, a three slash four-story building as it's tiered and then two-story buildings as they approach uh, as they approach the courts and the rest of the neighborhood. So, uh, and then you can see where it's, where it's delineated, three-story is blued out, and then the community center would be beneath that. I also want to mention with the community center, Adrian had mentioned the, the, that uh, he had mentioned some of the services that will be provided. We'll also provide uh, wraparound services for the residents. That's gonna include uh, our Homework First program which is a great place where kids, uh, at no additional charge to the, to the residents, would be able to go after school and essentially participate in our programs there where we you know, encourage homework, uh, making friends, a lot of those other, a lot of, uh, a lot of other services as well, such as health and wellness screenings, uh, potential food pantry programs, a, a whole host of services. And we also do that over the summer as well. In fact, just as past month, I was at the Capitol with, uh, with a lot of our children from our communities where we went up and held a mock legislative session um, for, uh, it was trying to pass a bill for, for all your school, I don't think it passed. So, uh, but anyway, that's, so, so that is something that we are also providing along with that. This one has 100 parking spaces, uh, so 88 units with 100 parking spaces. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Um, just for an idea of scale, I mean, we wanted to see, like, what you know, when you when they say the four-story building, three-story, we wanted to come up with an idea of scale of what was what was around there that was approximately three stories. Uh, the the Lanier is two stories, but it's it's a height equivalent of three stories as well as a Guadalupe height equivalent of three stories. We just want to kind of give a scale of what's in around the neighborhood. Next slide. Uh, additionally, some of the amenities we offer with this is a, a San Juan. Uh, down on Zasamora Street, so we uh, the community center and then uh, and uh, a business center that will also be existing in Alison. Next slide. Um, again, additional photos of the interior amenities. Next, more interior design examples, and we can again we can amend this uh, with input from the neighborhood. These are just examples of what we would, of kind of what we're thinking about, sort of leaning towards for what the interior is going to look like. Next. Uh, just final interior design examples. Please go ahead. Uh, we also want to commission for public art in the area. We have set aside for public art, and we do want to do that as well. This is some examples that we have previously done in some of our previous, um, in some of our other communities. Yep. Keep going. 
And so those were again, you know, that's that's fine. You can keep going. So besides the public art, those are some of, those are some other things that we want to keep doing. Again, the site plan is still in flux. We're still we're still trying to work with the city. We're still trying to take input. We've had other meetings uh, with the community, trying to scale it down a little bit as it moves into it. It's still keeping the unit count the same. And so that's I guess the primary goal is to provide at the end of the day uh, like new housing options for certainly the residents and other residents who want to move in and at the same time provide it in a high quality affordable housing. And at that point, at this point, I'll turn it over, I don't know, Lorraine, or uh, if you want to come up here to help address questions, or Munoz Architects, we have, the, at this time, I think we can open up to either questions or to public comments. What's the next order to do? Participate in homeowners association meetings 
And will we currently be able to have maybe represent um, Saha, represent NRP, in regards to this final decision of making maybe moves? Just to someone, to, even if it's an observer, somebody who's going to report back, just in regards to all the plans that have already been in place, that I see the plans that of here um, described by you in regards to plans that have been here for longer than the two years of all the going to Austin and um, you know when will those start being considered in regards to maybe even the multi planning um, for this area. So as soon as we get our zoning approved we resume our uh, design meet uh, so that we can start on the Alzheimer's blocks and that will trigger a whole host of meetings. And so we'll start, uh, or rather not start, but we'll continue our planning uh, now that we know that we have the funding in place, the zoning in place, and that we can get the first phase off the ground. And everyone's welcome. We made sure that we signed up and sent emails to everyone who's ever attended any of our meetings all the way back to 2016. So everyone is welcome. I was thinking more like tw um, 2006 matters. People, community members that's been attending meetings like this and so, um, in regards to planning, I'm, I'm thinking like way further back in 2016. And also, could y'all guys utilize a volunteer in regards to a resident to attend these meetings? Um, you know, to have a, you know, on the board again, a volunteer, um, just so that we're making sure that there is a resident and take it into consideration. I think I speak for more than thousands of uh, fa um, home uh, families that live in the area. Absolutely, and what she's saying is, is she, would she have the opportunity to volunteer or come to these meetings to represent the residents? And our answer to you is, everyone's welcome. We already have residents that are uh, that have been involved and have been included, and we invite you to continue uh, participating as well. Everyone's welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Next one is Sarah Gold. Gold. So I have to be the official time keeper, so I'm just going to remind you for a few minutes. So. Okay. Thank you so much for your efforts to get word out about this meeting to the community. Uh, I think we can see a lot of people came tonight and really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Sarah Gould. I'm director of the Museo de West Side, a forthcoming community museum located very close to here at the corner of Colorado and um, Guadalupe Street, yes, and uh, will be located in the historic Women's Ice House. Some of you might remember going to Women's Ice House when it was open. Um, so we're still in our planning phases, not unlike you, and um, I, I do have a question about, let me ask all three of my questions and then you can answer, okay? So my first question is about um, how, how will this development, do you think, impact um, the um, businesses and then the residents along the Guadalupe corridor and you know how, how can we work together to have a great experience as neighbors. Um, so that's question one. Question two um, is about the illustrations you've shown us so far. Um, they've all been bird's eye views and I'm just wondering if maybe between now and August 22nd you can give the community some street level views of it's hard to imagine what that looks like if you're a person on the street you know, walking by or walking to JT Broad. So if you could get us some kind of street level um, illustrations of the proposed buildings, showing the adjacent existing buildings, I think that would be really helpful. Uh, and then finally, I'm hoping you can offer a little more detail on the 80 affordable units. So you've said that 40 are public housing. But if you can explain the qualifications for the other 40 units, and also is there an expiration date on how long they will be public housing, how long they will be affordable units, that sort of thing. So first question, how will it impact the neighborhood and the residents living in the neighborhood, the businesses, the small businesses? It's only going to um, help support residents of this community as well as the small businesses. This uh, particular development, while it will bring uh, over some of the old Alazan residents into the new units, it will also bring new residents into the community. And that's important. We need to make sure that we have quality, affordable housing in this community in order for our families to have a place to go. Our kids who grow up and go on and move out, if there's nothing for them to come back to, then that's a problem. And we want them to come back. We need to support this community. We need to support the small businesses, all of our partners and cultural centers and what have you. So uh, it will only get better. The second question was with regards to the first. 
we'll get the elevations out. Right now they're just black and white, they're very conceptual. So uh, the reason why we left them just black and white is because there's going to be a lot of input from the neighborhood on whether it's brick, siding, stucco, or whatever the case may be, as we've been discussing with the we've been discussing with the architect. We were hesitant to show anything because if we show something and it and it just it's not necessarily what it's going to be. And so the, we can get you the black and whites that we had submitted, and that will give you an idea, especially we just created new ones because of the 4-3 split that we were talking about, and those are, I mean, created as of today and yesterday. So we can get those uh, additional into the community at large, uh, perhaps with the same type of, of what we had done. And then the third question you would answer? Okay, sure. So the third question was the different income strategies were basically like how the affordable works. Of the 80 affordable units, 40 are public housing. So those are going to be reserved as traditional public housing. And I believe Warren can speak to that if you want to know like those particular criteria as well. The remaining 40 are still also affordable housing. Those are reserved for those who make 60% of area median income and below. And by below, we also have different tiers beneath the 60%. There's those who make 60% area median income, 50% and 30% of area median income. And then you ask what's that mean? The area median income in San Antonio of this past year is 71,000. So 60% would roughly be about 45,000 for a family of four. It's tiered down. So if it's one person, it would be it would go down to the to around the 20,000, and the 50% would be lower, and the 30% would be lower than that. So so it does. So that's only half the affordable units. The other half are public housing, and then the other half have radiating tiers up to up to that level. So that's that's essentially how, uh, and we could we could actually show that to the neighbor too, neighborhood too, and how that's broken out. But in answer to your question, that's so. Oh, and that's your final question. So in perpetuity, we have an extended affordability, so for at least thirty years. Uh, but with Saha being the owner, um, that would be in perpetuity. So we have uh, Susana Segura. Did you? I'm sorry, ma'am. Did you did you fill out a card as well? Okay, we'll we'll get we'll get to you in just a moment. Susanna Segura. Hi, my name is Susanna, and I live right down the street behind the foyer. Uh, I don't live in the public housing projects, but I work with a lot of the community members that live there. And my concern is that they may be displaced. I don't want to lose my neighbors. Uh, I don't want to see that boy I have to shut down because there aren't enough students there. I don't want to have to see a Rockridge Elementary shut down because there aren't any students there. I want to make sure that people know that there are options available to them. And what y'all call opportunities, which are the Section 8 vouchers, are not necessarily something that is going to keep them in the neighborhood because there are, really isn't a lot of Section 8 housing here in the neighborhood. So just so that people do know that. I'm wondering what you're going to do um, when you're done building the Amazon lots. What is your plan for the older buildings, are you going to retrofit them? Are you going to demolish them? What are you going to do about that? So with regard to your concern regarding displacement, um, as we mentioned in previous planning sessions, it's always been our intent to do everything in phases so that we aren't having to relocate a mass of individuals all at once because we understand there's not enough housing in the neighborhood, quality housing. Um, but the other thing is, is please keep in mind, bear in mind, that some families do not want to live in the Alazan neighborhood. They are in the public housing units they're in only because that's what came up and that's what was available and they needed a place to live. So please understand that as well. We want to provide our residents a choice, a housing choice. Same choice we all have. To live wherever we want, wherever we feel comfortable, where our support system is, whether it's formal or informal, but it's important that our residents have that same opportunity that we give everybody else. Your next concern was with regard to schools. So the 501 units that you see on the ground are going to come back as mixed income. 
and will even increase the density, which will also in, increase the number of students that will be coming in. So not only will we have the students that are currently here, but we'll also bring new students to the neighborhood, which will help support our schools. And that's important as well. Angie Garcia. problems today in the 21st century and these buildings are very old back dated to 1940 and they need to be I need to be able to just because I'm a low income person I want to be able to provide a good home a safe home and be part of other programs and opportunities so I can give my children a better education and not just just giving them a little bit of what Saha can provide me and if the opportunity is here, I'm definitely going to take it and I'm just very grateful for you guys doing this and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I've been trying to find out over and over the last two and a half years of, of this planning. So I'm happy to tell you that every single of the unit of the 88 will have washer and dryers in the unit. Not just connections, they will have washer and dryers, which is huge for a single parent that's taking care of kids, a grandparent who lives there with their grandkids and needs to get the, keep those kids in school every day, so in uniforms, 
are expensive, and so it's important to keep those clean. Um, and so we heard you, and, and we're doing it. Irma Hoffman. Hello, I, I have at least two questions. So, um, number one, I know that you said that 4,424 uh, affordable housing, where, where public housing, is that correct? 40, okay, thank you. So, um, when those residents move out, what will happen to, again, I know, I know you all have discussed this, but I, I've got to clear it in my mind. What will happen to the other residents? There's 501 families. That's, that's question number one. And then question number two, I just wanted to go over these numbers with you to see if this is correct. Or not. But if we could go over question number one. Yes. Question number one, where will the rest of the families go? Again, this is only the first phase. Um, recently, you heard in the newspaper that Saha is doing a lot of development deals with a lot of different developers because of the great need for affordable housing. And so we have other developments that are still within the west side that we can also uh, relocate individuals to so that they can stay in the west side if that is their preference. And again, we'll be doing it in phases so that we have enough housing to do it. So whether they go through public housing or they go on a Section 8 voucher, there's an opportunity for them to stay in the neighborhood. So that will occur in 2020? 20 when, 2020 is when we begin the construction, okay? And then when the property is completed, at that point is an opportunity for us to move some of the old Alice on, uh, or some of the Alice on residents that live in the old units over to the new units in 2021, in 2021, December. And then, I mean, but you're not talking about all 500? No, ma'am, a little at a time. Okay. So the Alice on, uh, apartments right now, as they are, will still exist. Yes, and, until we, we, we get enough uh, buildings that have been uh, empty, that we've been able to relocate families safely, and then we'll start uh, the redevelopment of the Alazan ports. Okay, so when you say redevelopment, does that mean we remodeling them? Or? I, and I apologize, but no. The, we have done physical needs assessments on these buildings, and they are way beyond their useful life. The residents can attest to this. Uh, they need to be brought down, and we need to start it. So okay, so when they're so the so when they're demolished, then by that time, all the residents that live there will be uh, already have other homes. Right, right, before we can start that, but not all at once. Again, in phases. So we're not going to clear out all 501 units at once. It's going to be a little at a time. Okay. And so some may live in the area, or some may choose to live. Renovations, depending on what vouchers are available to for housing. So with any uh, revitalization effort, we're looking to uh, demolish an old public housing. We apply to HUD for relocation vouchers, and so they provide them to us so that we, we have enough on hand to be able to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, and can I go over these numbers? We can also, you can, because I know that when you say 60% annual median income, okay. it's for me it's confusing. So, so you said the area median income in San Antonio is seventy-one thousand. Okay, so we're going down. These these will be for the other forty. Uh, when you said uh, that that you will go by sixty percent, even yeah. different tiers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's different tiers, but it's also for it's also based on family size. Okay. So that's for a family of four. So as you keep going down. Uh, and for example, a family of three, two, one, it actually, those numbers get considerably smaller. And bear in mind, that's the maximum, two. That's the maximum a person can make. That's why it's, that's why it's affordable. When we say 60 and under, if you have a voucher, or, uh, or if you, if you, if you, uh, if you desire to live there, you can still live there. It's, it's, that's, again, that's the maximum. Hence, hence the uh, affordable housing. And it goes down to, as you said, the 30% uh, uh, 21,300 
But those one that no. but those rents are not uh, indicative of the six of the sixty percent. They're not. No, those not even close to that. I, I can I we can provide the rents that are going to be, but those are uh, those are much 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 higher than what they would be at sixty percent. Yes, because we were getting them from statistics, you know. So so could you please provide the correct monthly rent? Of course. I mean, but before we're done today. Before we're done today, I can start looking it up right now. Why everybody? Uh, okay. Hi, 
I am, I've been displaced twice now um, in my lifetime, once in San Antonio. As a single mom with three kids, both times were equally as traumatizing, losing my neighborhood and watching my community, my neighbors, just, um, you know, uh, lose their homes and have to move away. And um, I see that that's, I, that that's what I understand now is happening. 500 units are being demolished. Not at once. Right, I understand the whole thing. Um, and so for 44 units inside of the Alison box. So no, no buildings will be demolished for the 44 units? No. I'm saying, so 500 units are being demolished in phases, and 44 are being built in the first phase. Okay, and so will all of those people, can we make sure, can we do it in a way in which nobody ever has to leave this neighborhood at all, that they get to stay at the schools, that they get to stay where their dance class is at and their home? Like, so you're saying that at this point, the way that the phases are planned to go is so that nobody will get be forced to relocate? Well, if they want to leave. If they want to stay in this community, they have that choice. If they want to leave this community, they also have that choice. And then every person who wants to stay in this community will 100% be guaranteed a public housing unit, no, brand new. Not a, not a public housing unit. They have the choice to go public housing or Section 8 voucher, and that is their choice. I can tell you historically, in the past, the majority choose, probably about 70 to 80% choose to go on the Section 8 voucher. And do people understand if Saha knows the housing crisis going on? And so it's getting more and more unaffordable closer to the inner city, especially the west side. We see the highest inflated prices, the pushing values in the entire country. Um, and so, so do, are people being informed? Like, back to you, um, and you know, how can I get involved? How can I be a leader? How can I make sure that all of my neighbors know what's going on? What are you guys going to do to intensely engage the community in this entire process? Because I've talked to a lot of the Alison, of course, residents, and they, have, they don't even know anything that's going on. And so what is Saw going to do to go into those communities? and get that feedback and make sure that it's part of it. Not just you know community meetings in which everybody gets three minutes to ask a couple questions and then get some answers and some non-answers. Instead, that they get to leave here fully informed and have a say in how these next phases go. That's a great question. I'm gonna pass it to Adrian because we have to do the next survey. So um, when we started this process for the Choice Initiative back in 2017, we actually went house to house. Every single unit was knocked on. Uh, we did um, uh, surveys. There was approximately a little less than 300 uh, respondents. And we collected a whole slew of information uh, on our residents. Not just about sort of what their housing needs were, but as you probably could imagine, imagine our families need childcare, they need education, they need you know, health services, they need clothing, they need food, they need all of these types of things, right? So we took that collective data to, you know, start to try to figure out how we actually provide those services. If and when at some point in the, in the future that we actually are fortunate enough to where we get dollars to start to actually demolish and start to potentially move people, we've got, we've done this experience before, we've had this, where we actually will do another updated survey to look at those particular populations and those people to figure out what are their specific needs and provide intense case management. So Surveys aren't good enough. Um, quantitative data isn't good enough for stuff like this. We need to be like, you need to be on the ground talking to people and engaging them in the every single step of the process and giving them the opportunities, such as childcare, you know, such as pizza and food. But I mean, frequently, it can't just be one of these meetings and then people are going to, you know, start getting displaced. Okay, so when's the next meeting going to be? We'll let you know. So, yeah, I guess we'll let you know. Time frame? Uh, probably within the next 60 days. Next 60 days here? Okay. Oh, you can also follow, follow us on this Facebook. And if not, we will keep you updated. We have all of your emails. If you signed in today, um, and you provided us your email, we'll provide you with information, we'll provide you with invitations to attend. The other thing I think is important to say, because I know that there's a lot of misinformation in the community going on in the community, we are not a soapworks. We are not a mission trail. This is Saha. This is our mission. This is what we do. When we create housing, it's not to displace our residents. It's to build a new quality housing. And that's important. 
And I think all of you need to know that. It's what we do. Affordable housing is what we do. We do mixed income, yes, because in order to get those deep subsidized units, we have to have a mix of income levels in order to support those developments. But please know that. It is our mission, it's what we do. It's for the long haul, not short term. Next person is Gabriel Velasquez. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming to the Avenue Land Association this week and presenting to the, the residents that participate in the Avenue Association. Well, membership that day showed up about 50 yeah. so members. Remember addresses, what we said. Addresses. Please remember house rules. Addresses. Um, but but I want to uh, just for the record, you know, state that I stand with the residents of the Alasan Apache. Uh, housing and, and with the resident council. Um, this young lady that spoke a second ago, I think it's um, only for us to listen to the residents that live there, that this is their experience. There's a lot of people that were born and raised in the West Side, but not all of them were poor. My father was born and raised in the West Side, in this area, and they were very, very poor. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a good job that the housing authority has done, and it's had its bumps in the road over the decades. But there was a time when the, the uh, uh, community found out that they were gonna build public housing, and the slum mortgage raised all the prices of the properties, making it impossible for there to be public housing. And Eleanor Roosevelt called the president, uh, was called by uh, Carmelo Trencasey, and she came to visit him, and she saw the conditions of the people living in the slums. And there's a famous phone call where she tells her husband, these people need housing. And there's something happening in this community, I hope all the leaders can take time to consider that today, we don't think twice when saving a cantina. But when it comes to public housing for the poor, we're saying, not in my backyard. There's something wrong, very wrong. I think it's a time when we have the convenience of owning properties, that we look around us and we decide what we want. And we forget that we still are in the poorest neighborhood in the city of San Antonio. In 1979, the median household income in this community was $12,000 a year. Today, it's 11,400. Those are facts. But it's to each and every one's conscience. When you stand up, you get this microphone, and you take your PhDs and your public service, and you know that deep down inside, you have a self-interest. As we're taught, right, that everybody organizes out of their self-interest. But the people that are living in the public housing, like you said, they get a, they, 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 they apply and they live where there's opportunity. Uh, we can only support our residents of the Yala San Apache because, let me, let me just close with this, friends and, and neighbors. When you add up all the houses and all the brothers and sisters that live in those houses, those numbers don't come anywhere near the amount of single mothers raising their children in the public housing projects. I appeal to your, to your conscience, set your self-interest aside, and let's let our residents continue to empower themselves. Because if you go deep enough in your own family history, you are them. We are them. So from the Avenida Guadalupe Neighborhood Association, established in 1979 and 78 and 77, in all its different iterations, we're with you. Thank 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 I live on 17th and Veracruz. I grew up in this neighborhood. I took dance classes here with parks and recreation. So I'm a resident of the West Side. Uh, my concern is for the residents of the Alasan and displacement. Um, I have two questions. Well, maybe three. Uh, do you have a breakdown of the one, two, and three bedroom apartments, the, the number of one, two, and three bedroom apartments? and how many of those would be available for public housing. He's going to look it up and we can go to the next one. Okay, the other question is actually for the residents of the Alasan courts. How many of you have been 
promise or how many of you actually believe that you will be able to move into the new housing project, the Alasan Lot? Okay. And I'm, I mean, I, my biggest concern is for y'all, if you want to be here, you should stay here. We don't want to leave, lose anybody from the west side. We don't want the number of students from JT Breckenridge to, to go down uh, because you have to move to another part of the city. What will you do if you do not get housing in the Alison Lofts project? I'm just asking, have you considered those questions? Because the reality is that there are 500 units and there are only 40, or 40, sorry, public housing um, units available. So, I mean, there, there are going to be people who are not going to be able to move into the new loft project. I want to say that I am totally supportive of public housing and new housing here in the west side. We are all in support of that. Um, Gabriel and Vasquez. There's nobody here in this room that is against Saha working on a project to better the west side. That is not the case at all. We're just concerned that people are going to have to leave the west side and we don't want that to happen. Can, uh, do you want me to answer your first two questions and then you can answer? I'm definitely still for the third. I, we're you not know, trying to cut you off. I just wanted to address them at a time. So the so the, the breakdown is in building A, which is just depending on, you know what, I'm going to give you option B because that's a, the that's a option we're shooting for. So that's the uh, four-story building. It's got 48 units. It's got eight one-bedrooms, 42 two-bedrooms, and 14 three-bedrooms. And then uh, the, 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 other, the other side, the building, the building B, would be 16 two-bedrooms and eight three-bedrooms. They're just going to be divided in half. They're they're all equally proportioned. So there 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 is no, we're not slinging like to get more rent. We're not slinging the sixty percent over at the three bedrooms. But to answer your your other question, and I think you had a question, and I know you addressed it to the residents, but it's something I want to just reiterate to the to the whole group. This is on top of the five hundred and one units. So I think uh, it's important to note that nothing is being replaced with Alison Lofts. Not a not not. It's again, we're not trying to replace anything at this moment. We want to build this and then move whatever residents are, whatever residents can, move into the move into Alison Lofts. So that's on top of the 501. So consider it 501 units and then 589, basically. We're moving that. And then we are going, then at that point, Saha, not me, but Saha will start with, the, with, with either a second phase maybe equally around 88 units that they can find the land to move it into, or they'll start phasing demolition so nobody would be able to be displaced. The most important thing that we want to reiterate to the entire group here is that if everybody wants to stay in this neighborhood, they will stay in this neighborhood. That's the most important thing. So so uh, I think you had, did you have a third question too? Okay, so who's next? Could I say that? Paper to um, clarify one of my questions and to get one of my answers questions. Well, we'll we'll, we'll go to we'll go to right. that again. Right. Yeah, my name is Graciela Sanchez. Um, I also grew up in this neighborhood. I went to Greece, I went to Cooper, I went to Lanier, class of 78, yeah. Um, and I'm tired of people saying that I'm not from the neighborhood. I also now live off of Sarsamora and Monterrey. I don't live in the public housing, but I'm with the Esperanza and we also own property, the Rinconcito de Esperanza, that'll be right across the public housing. and. Um, and a couple of, well, let me see. So I just want to, you know, challenge um, 
Gabriel Velasquez to claim that we're not supporting the public housing. When the first meeting was held about the lofts, because that's different for us than the choice grant, we understood there were more buildings and, I mean, more apartments, and most of those were market rate, and we challenged that, and to your credit, market rate housing went down, and public housing went up. And that's because we challenged it, and we said, we want the LSI residents to stay here. And we would say, and we would love 88 units to be public housing. We're not afraid, we want people que están aquí, que se queden aquí. If you want, que viva el West Side. So I just don't want us to be pitted against you all. We support housing, we especially want housing for la gente trabajadora, humilde, and so we're with you, okay? Um, I'm concerned that, and I want to challenge again, that this is, the, for me, the first public meeting about the Alazan Law since February of this year. And the same sort of slide presentation was then, then as well as now. And so, again, we're disappointed. We're disappointed because, you know, I think you've learned, but we also have a history with Saha. I remember living at next to the Victoria Courts. And I remember marching with the Victoria Courts residents when they were going to tear them down. And the people didn't want to move. And they got pushed out, and most of those people didn't come back. And that was a few years ago, but I was there marching. But that was a Saha, a Hope Six project. And that pushed people out. And the San Juan homes, although we've heard people came back, only 2% of the people that lived at the San Juan homes came back. 2%. And according to you, Lorraine, 20% of the people that lived at the Wheatley Courts came back. So we're concerned when we hear that this is one phase one, but there are 501 units right now, and they're going to only make room for 40 public housing units for you all. And then when they tear down the other ones, we want to make sure that there is housing here. So you say there's going to be room. Where? Tampico lofts, how many of those are going to be for public housing? Where else in the West Side do you have right now or the next two years? So when pe when those 325, there was an application to for Saha to apply for 325 units that just went before the Saha meeting on August 1st. 325. So where, so my, our concern is those buildings may be demolished before there's housing units for the people, and so you all will have a choice to come back, but if it's two years, three years, four years, you may never come back. So we're concerned. Those are the questions that we're concerned about. Um, okay. So it's just we also have a history with, uh, with Saha and the lack of keeping people in their places. And understood. And, and we acknowledge that. And we're telling you that we are doing it better. We've learned. And we are listening. And I think we've proven that. We have tried very hard to uh, accommodate everyone's desires. But as you know, it's not possible to do everything for everyone. And so we've tried to find a middle ground. And that's as best as we can do. As far as, I want to I wanna make this very, very clear. We in no way are thinking we're going to put 501 people in 40 units. Please understand that. It's been said over and over, but that is a misconception. There is no way we can do that. And we know, and that's why I'm telling you, making sure you know that that is not the plan. And they know it, because we've been planning this for over two and a half years. And they know that we are looking to build other developments so that we can individuals that want to stay in the neighborhood within the neighborhood and those that choose to move away that is their choice again just like we have a choice to live where we desire they should also next person so, I'm so, H. Sorry, let me, let me, uh, I, I just need to respond to this issue about um, the percentages the 30 percent AMI 40 percent 50 and 60 percent so when I started the meeting earlier I told you about those 28 graduates right uh, FSS, right, that went and got themselves educated, 
They either got their high school diploma, their GED, got a certification, and got employed, right, that made their, their income uh, rise. So just this Saturday, we have a huge partnership with Alamo Colleges, and we enroll residents into what's called the Health Professions Opportunity Grant. So one of the residents said earlier, I'm a, I'm a single parent of five children. Right? Here's what happens with those residents is they go and they get themselves educated, right? And they get uh, the, their opportunity to graduate from programs like that and, and get good jobs, right? Where they're going to be making about thirty-five, forty thousand dollars a year or whatever. But based on their family size, they're still considered low income. So when we're looking at you know these housing units, right? Yes, we want to serve and have a certain percentage for people who are making thirty percent AMI or lower. But we also want to provide opportunities for people who went back to school and got themselves educated and got themselves into training because many of them, their, their inc uh, income will increase, but they still cannot afford to live in certain parts of the city. That's what this project represents, is not only opportunities for existing residents of El Valasan who are making 30% AMI or lower, but also for those who decide that they want to improve themselves and maybe they can't sort of, you know, at some point, you know, uh, until maybe their kids graduate from, from high school to move out because, you know, their income, while it may increase, may still not be enough to actually, um, you know, be, be able to sort of have them afford other, other opportunities somewhere else. So that, that speaks to the 40, 50, and 60% AMI, right? Because when you crunch those numbers, you look at, the, at, at income, even somebody making $25,000 a year, 30% of their income is still about $7,500 worth, of, worth of, of rent, right? So, 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 so I just wanted to sort of say that within the context of, we're talking about opportunities for existing residents who, who maybe like elderly, who could not sort of, are gonna be on a fixed income, cannot you know, necessarily increase their income, but we're also talking about opportunities for people who can increase their income. We don't wanna kick them up, right? We wanna give them an opportunity for them to live here. Thank you, Adrian. Jaime H. Jaime, you still here? Okay, we're gonna go to the next one. Keto Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, my name is Keto Rodriguez. I'm born here on the West Side. I went to JT Brackenridge, to Tafoya, and to, and I graduated from Lanier in 1988. Um, uh, first off, I want to say thank you. Uh, for what y'all do in, in trying to you know uh, create affordable housing. We know that it's a crisis across the city and it is across the country, and we recognize that. I want to make it very clear to others as well. I didn't grow up in the Alasan. I grew up right on the other side of the bridge. In fact, all of my friends that I hung out with, I really wanted to live in the courts. Uh, all of my friends are in the courts. Why can't we live in the courts? Um, and I couldn't. But I spent all of my childhood right here on Golima Street with my good friend Iris, and on the Fountain Street behind it with my good friend Eleanor, who's no longer with us. And so I want to make sure that everybody here understands that the people that are here that don't live in the Alasan courts are only here because we care, because it's in our heart, because it's because we are you. We are you. We're just like you. And because I went away for a while and maybe I got educated and um, you know maybe I make more money now, that doesn't mean that I've forgotten who I am and where I come from. And that's everybody. I don't know anybody here who grew up on the West Side that wasn't poor. And my friends would tell me, you know, hey, you're rich, you have a house. Well, you went into my house <laughs> and saw the, all the political signs on the window because the window, we couldn't afford to replace them, or all the pots and pans everywhere because the roof was bad. Like, there still are in a lot of houses in this neighborhood. You don't understand that, no, we weren't poor. And so I could choose to live anywhere, anywhere in this city. I could live in Stone Oak, I could live anywhere. But I, I don't want to. I want to live here. I want to f continue to fight for people just like the ones that I grew up with. I want to continue to fight just like so many people here have been fighting for decades for everyone in this community. Because we are Westside. We're Westsiders, I mean, through and through, puro corazón. And so I just want to make that clear that we're fighting because, like Graciela said, yes, we have a history and we want to make sure that things are correct or that things are done fairly and justly. And then the next thing that I'll say is that it's very, and, and, I, and I get it, I understand what you said about the, the design of this, but people have invested so much of their time for years and going, right, going back to 2005. 
about what we wanted to preserve. What we wanted to preserve about our culture, about our community, and people spent hours and hours and hours planning and coming to meetings and doing all of this stuff. And then it often feels like that just kind of goes by the wayside because, oh, well, we just got to do this and that's that. They're going to have to live with it. And I appreciate the fact that you've been working with Esperanza and some of the other people here to try to kind of scale things down. But please understand the frustration, the frustration of going through, we, we plan the, you know, you've got the, the West Side plan, the Guadalupe plan, all of these plans, and it seems like people just don't go back and read them and just stick to what it is that the community developed. And so, you know, again, thank you. I understand that it's a very difficult situation to be in, but I want to make it very clear to everybody that we are here with you, and nobody here is out of self-interest because we could be anywhere else. So thank you. Henry Rodriguez. Thank you very much. Uh, after that, I don't know what to say. <laughs> well, I'm Henry Rodriguez. I'm the executive director for Lula Concilio Zapatista. We have a long history with the San Antonio Housing Authority. Not all of it has been good, but then again, partnerships can be good. We can always come together again and, uh, and, and do the, what we believe is right. We had a horrible situation, and this was one of the most egregious things that could ever happen, and then was Mirasol those 20 million dollars for homes and everything that they that that hb homes everything that they did was wrong from the i know because i was on the task force committee there i was appointed by patty rail when she was on council and there was a horrible thing and i think it did not have a very good ending either because those people that suffered there they should have gotten punitive damages and all they got was a little bit of money and okay that's it uh, I'm sorry, that, that's what happened. I was there, I'm a witness to that. So what I want to say is, uh, I'm also a member of the uh, uh, Community Development Council. It's right there in the west side across the bridge. And that, and that council, we also built affordable housing throughout the state, not just here in San Antonio, through tax credits. And uh, uh, my, uh, my uh, executive director, Walter Martinez, does an excellent job of keeping the tabs, and we know how hard it is to get those tax credits from the state. So having said that, again, I just follow up what Keta said, and then there's, we have to be ever vigilant of anybody that comes into this community and tells us we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and this goes for the residents and everybody else. Be very wary. Please, read the fine print. Look at everything that's there so things won't just go over your head or by the wayside. And I really, but again, we really thank you for, for this is a great program, we need it. And I, I live in three addresses here at the other side, on Colima, on, on, on uh, Colorado, and on in Mirasol growing up. And there was a lot of problems, and I can tell you what, I was part of the problem at one time. <laughs> so I thank you very much. This has been, this is great, okay? Thank you. I think that you brought a very important point. And you do have to be vigilant because we know there are, are prospectors in the area that are looking to purchase uh, property as well as uh, occupied houses. That's not Saha. Saha is not doing that. Please understand that. We're not looking to purchase occupied homes. We, we purchased vacant land in order to rebuild or to build rather new housing. So I just want to make that clarification. Jessica? Okay. Well, a lot of my questions have been answered, but as a resident of the Amazon, um, my name is Jessica Bowman, and I'm a single mom, and I'm on disability. So moving isn't exactly the easiest thing for me. I live here, and this is my family. I have zero family besides my children in San Antonio. So one thing that does bother me is knowing that the people who grow to become my family is going to be non-existent. <laughs> um, I do strive to send my daughter to a good school. I didn't keep her in the area. I chose to put her in a advanced learning academy downtown. Um, I walk. 
two miles each way when my daughter wants to attend after school clubs on 100 degree weather just so she can attend the school clubs that she wants to attend. So my fear is, is that I'm not going to be anywhere close to where my daughter goes to school because I can't afford to take the VA 30 days out of the month to pick her up and bring her home. Um, and I don't want her to miss out on her activities that she has in school by being placed even further away from where she is at school. Um, and then my other concern is construction. How will that affect us as residents who live right near where you are starting the, the um, building? Yeah. Okay, so I'll take your first question. And we understand your concern. And that is why we are being very thoughtful about how we go about this redevelopment process. Um, we're making sure that we build first. Again, we're looking to build units within the west side in order for individuals to be able to stay in the neighborhood, those that want to, so that it will be uh, a smooth transition from an old public housing unit into your new beautiful modern unit. Well, I've always supported the idea. I was with you when um, yeah. you went to speak about it. It's just my concern is I don't want to have to, all my doctors are downtown. My daughter's school is downtown. And this is my family. Like, I have zero family in San Antonio. So the west side, the good and the bad, has become, I'm not even from here, I'm from Virginia in a small town. But this is actually the best spot for my daughter to go to school and have an education. Because there are no schools like there are here in San Antonio off of where I'm from. You get one choice and one choice and that's it. Um, so I guess, Understood. The west side is now part of me, even though I'm not from the west side. Well, we welcome you. This is your home. And all we want to do is make your home better. So Jason's going to address it. The construction question. On, on, so construction is going to take about 14 months overall. But, that, but most of that is going to be interior work. Uh, so again, it's the it's it's site excavation and the exterior. Is it going to affect the like outages, like cause outages no. of water, electricity? No, 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 no. It's not going to do that. Uh, so it should not do that at all. And in fact, dust should be kept to a minimum. With all the new standards that we have to do for soap screening and a variety of other things, it should keep it down. The only time that noise is going to be an issue, I think, would be early in the morning, and that's when we're going to be pouring foundation. Foundation just gets poured early in the morning. Uh, because it'll start around the summer and it's real hot, and so it gets that's get port that just for transparency. That's going to be five in the morning, uh, four in the morning when they pour that. That'll be about the only time when it's going to be uh, if you're going to be noticing that while there's still a lot of residents there. But the rest of the construction is going to occur during the day, and then certainly once it gets moved interior, that should not be bothering anybody. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. So the units that are currently surrounding where you are building, are those going to be the first ones that you consider demolishing? That kind of not necessarily. It's probably going to be start on the, again, this is the Saha, the Saha led initiative. So it'll probably be a little bit more on the west side of Colorado. But, we, but it's not necessary. That is completely still to be determined. Because I don't like change, and I don't know how many people in here do not like change, so this is all scary for me. But I mean, it's something that you want for a community to become a better enrichment community, enrichment, but at the same time. We're with you to understand change. Change is good, and for a lot of us. But change can be good, and that's what we're hoping to accomplish. Make your life better for you and your kids. Francisco? How are you doing? I don't, I am not, you know the other song? He lives uh, four or five blocks down the street. And I just have a question for Saha. Uh, how do you guys have a study of how it's going to affect this one to the community? And how it's going to affect the, the economy? How it's going to affect the culture, how it's going to affect the traffic, water, all these kind of things. When you put a big project like this, um, in my place, I am afraid that this is going to start being the, the first stage of gentrification. And my taxes are going to start going up. Uh, I see it with my friends in the east side, I see it in the south side. Uh, I moved over here from Mexico City in 2000. I was living in, the, in Broadway by the Pearl. And in 10 years, you know, you see that change. Okay? So I am just afraid of that. That is why one of my questions if you guys have studied what is around this, what is how it's gonna affect the community other than the, the residents. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
presence, yeah, the presence is, is important, but also the community, what is going to happen with the Esperanza Center, with all the cultural centers, with the schools, with all these kind of things. Like, have you do a uh, study about this, or, or is just a project? So that is my question. So we did actually do a market study, and that does take into account the neighborhood, the economic impact, uh, and, and a variety, a variety of other questions. However, it doesn't necessarily get into depth with the culture, and so that's that's certainly a legitimate question. Uh, I would, you know, the idea is revitalization without any justification. I mean, the, the, to a certain degree, uh, you know, the, the, we are we, that's 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 really the the, the goal. Well, you can see it on the scene, this happening. Oh, yes, yeah. an example of that is, and we need to criticize ourselves, we need to be criticized ourselves, this happening. Maybe it's not the same, it's not, maybe it's not the best way to go. We need to ask, sometimes to also think another option. Well, and that's because why. Because that, those, those apartments, they look the same like the ones in the east side, the ones in the south side. It's just a bit being put over there. So we need to start thinking. I, mean, I don't see any uh, development on the sustainability. The traffic is the same, the parking lot is the same, a lot of parking lots, you know, nothing like, like uh, sustainability again, you know, energy, renewable energy, nothing like this, it's just a, another project like the other ones. I, that, this is just my concern, you know. And being over here is how it's going to affect me, because it's going to affect me in the economic way, basically. You know, I am afraid. First, my taxes are going to go up. I am very sure. I already have them. I get over there and I am sure it's going to happen to me. Okay, so that is my other thing. And the other thing is uh, the community, how it's going to work, the transportation, all those kind of things. And if you have that story, can I have access to see it? Sure. Okay. Um, my other question is, you are talking about the 88 units over here. Ten days ago, it was uh, on SACA uh, webpage, a project for 325 units in the Alasan, okay, for the next, uh, uh, for 44 million dollars, uh, funding for that one. For the 325 Alasan uh, project, $44 million. Um, um, you know, so that means then we start with this one and you guys gonna jump to the other one. The other one, how far is gonna, um, absorb, is gonna absorb all these units? So how far is it? You know, because also I don't think this plan is just that we are going 325 and we need $44 million. That no is a plan, I think. It should be, right? Right. So. We are looking to redevelop all of Alasan Apache eventually. So you're so going to demolish everything and you're going to create these, these buildings. This is what you are saying? We're gonna, so we've got three public housing developments in this west side neighborhood, right? Alasan Apache, we have Casiano, we have Lincoln. Right now we're focusing on just Alasan. Our goal is to redevelop Alasan and then we can look at the Apache. We can then look at Casiano and Lincoln. So this 325, we're going to demolish the one. So where are we going to go this 325? So the, the 325, what we did is we're looking ahead. Right, planning right, right. For the yes. future. So in order, for, okay. and, and in order for us to get in line for bonds, we needed to submit an application by the 15th, which is tomorrow. And that's why that went to the board, because we're planning for the future for the Alazan courts, the 500. Well, I think it was allowed already for $44 million for that project. They, sorry. It was $44 million they approved. Right? Up to and up. like I say, it's 325. I don't think I just say, like, oh, I'm going to do 325 units. I think it's a plan. It's up to, it's up to Because it's the same I saw the plan over there by La Villita, the 24 floors, the same high rise apartment complex, the same like the tower. I also found for Saha for a public housing. And then I, I don't know how it's going to be a public housing in a high rise in downtown, you know? So those are the things. It doesn't make sense to me. You know? So we're, we're doing things that you've never heard of before. We're no, the same working. things. I see the same yeah, things. No, 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 things. I see what is, is, is happening in the city. Okay, so let me address the first one with Alasan. Right now, I can't give you specifics because we're 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 in the RFP process for a developer to develop redevelop all the 501 units in phases, and so that is on the street right now. We're looking for someone to do that. Once we do that, then we start talking planning on how we can develop that entire area and what it's going to look like and how many units and what kind of units and the whole nine yards. So we're at the very beginning of the stage, meaning we just needed to get in line so that when uh, April, I mean August 15th comes, we're in line for bonds, we apply for what's called a carry forward, and that gives us three years to plan. Okay. 
basically, well, basically, thought they were going to be demolished and we were right. Eventually, yes, they were. Um, I knew, I guess you guys, uh, three, two, the, two weeks ago in the Sony um, meeting, you guys were applying for the IBC3 Sony, we were checking for the MF33 to IBC3. And my question is, why IBC3? Why don't IBC2? I went to, I made my homework, I went and I started reading the, the, the code and everything, and because I was wondering why IBC3. Um, IBC3 is really open, it says the highest, it, you can go the highest you want, you can do basically whatever you want. IBC2, it has more limits, right? So just uh, that would be one of my question. What was the decision? Why IBC3 and why no IBC2? So, so this would be your last question, sir. Give me about five so, minutes. Yeah, yeah, just to see. We used IBC3 for the setbacks and for some of the other accommodative measures, including the parking. Uh, and it was also for the four-story, uh, whereas IBC2 was on the same floor. Huh? Uh, the parking, even IBC3, even in the parking says you can go 50% of the... No, 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 I know, I just for, I just in general. Well, I just... But, the, but, also, but also for the, well, for the height, too. Because MF33 allows four stories. Say what again? IBC2 allows four stories. IBC3 allows... It, 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 it was for a variety of things, which I think, Jeff, can you speak to the IDC3 for the reason why we chose IDC3, or is that more of a civil question? Because I know it also had to do with some of the with the, some of the setbacks as well. Did you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, Jason, I, I thought it had to do with the number of stories. I yeah, I thought it had to do with the stories, too, because I thought IDC3 was for four. IDC3 was for four. Okay, Caroline? Yeah, that was the this is Caroline with uh, Brown and Ortiz. In addition to the parking, it's also the number of units. Or not the parking. Uh, it's that we needed non-commercial parking on some of those vacant lots across the street. And because of the separation, because of the right-of-way, um, we had to have some of that standalone parking as, uh, and that's why we requested the IDC. <laughs> It's not the amount of parking spaces, it's because it's standalone parking that we had to have a commercial use in addition to the multifamily use. Who is it who's speaking next? Yannette Flores? Yannette Flores? Um, hi, my name is Yannette. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so, really quickly, I know my, my time is limited, but I do want to clarify like the notion that um, the courts are in bad shape because they just like got in bad shape. We need to acknowledge that there is a landlord, right, and the landlord is Saha, and, and you fail to maintain the courts. So, you know, if my landlord doesn't keep up with my apartment, then it is on him because I am paying my rent in order for him to Right, so that's um, that's the first thing that needs to be clarified. Folks, don't let them put it on you. It is on your landlord to fix your, your home. Um, now, I do have a question that's very particular. How many people are currently in your wait list uh, for public housing? I feel like this is like a number that we should have already yeah, over 30,000. Over 30,000 combined with Section 8 of public housing. Combined with Section 8 of public housing. Um, so, how will you select the public housing residents for the 40 units in the box? So, first of all, we would provide a preference for the Alazon residents that would be affected first. Depending we, yes, we were assuming. Uh, uh, yeah, we're assuming that these folks are coming from the Alazon lofts or, or the Alazon groups. How will you select the 40 residents that will then move on to the lofts? Well, I assume that once applications open up, everybody is going to apply. Right. So it's and it's done, first come first serve. Done in order. Okay. Um, what folks take notice? Take notice, y'all. <laughs> Take notice. Um, man, I just have so many questions. It's evident that we need more community meetings. Um, what? Okay. What exactly does the next phase for this look like? Um, and I and I want to add in there that there are thirty thousand people in your wait list, right? So I think that it is critical that in there you have two for one replacement. 
right? Because there's clearly a wait, a, a heavy wait list. So in order to alleviate some of that, we should be doing all that we can to make sure that we are building more affordable housing. Because everybody in this room, Amen. right? Again, we should. Everything. We should stand together and make sure we're building as much affordable housing as we can do. Hell yeah. And we can. Yeah. We agree. But how are you going to do that? Exactly. Well, two for one, right? Like that. that's a thing that you really need to consider. So, this is something that's us committed to. We will no longer have fully 100% public housing communities. We're not doing that anymore. We're not warehousing the poor people. That's not correct. We will always do mixed income or affordable housing, 100% affordable housing. And, and in order for us to do this, it's a financial thing. How can we structure this development? How many units of uh, DP subsidized units can we get into this development supported by the affordable, supported by the market? So I can tell you that yes, it is difficult and we do need more. But Saha is not the only developer in the city. And we can't do the But 30, you are our developer. We can't do 30,000 on our own. And the city is aware of that. And that's why we have that commission now that is pushing to make sure that all developers within the city of San Antonio are including affordable housing within their goal. But Saha, yes, that's our mission and that's our goal, to do as many as we can. Okay, so I'm planting the seed, two for one, two for one. Uh, can you commit to ensuring that everybody that currently lives at the courts has the right to return under public housing? They have the right if they choose to. Okay, so. I'll, I'll We're being recorded right now. Yes. Um, so again, following up on that first question, what exactly does the next phase of this project look like um, in stages of like, you know, you do plan to phase it out, which I think is phenomenal. That's how it should be done. Um, but what exactly does that look like? Um, because I am um, concerned as to how many of the 501 units that are going to be redeveloped, right? I'm assuming that you're going to make more than that. Um, how many of those will be market rate? But most importantly, how many of those are going to be public housing? So I can't tell you. I, I already explained that we have an RFP out. We're looking for a master developer to help us with this plan. So what I can tell you is about Alizan Lofts, which is why we're here this evening, is to talk about the Alizan Lofts. And when we get started on the overall master plan for the area, we will make sure you're included, not a problem. And lastly, um, how many of the jobs um, are you, no, I actually have two more questions. <laughs> um, this, why, will your, this will be your last question. No, okay. I'm at five minutes already. Why did you ignore the community plan, um, seemingly from the beginning of this um, design process, and can you pledge to respect and follow the exist three existing community plans that your design has supported. So I'm going to let you know, and I, as we've said already, that we have tried and we have met, even at, even without our residents, we've met with you, which you know we didn't we didn't have to do, but we did because we respect you, and we are trying to do what we can to find a middle ground. And that's all I can tell you. Is we're trying to find a middle ground. City is my home. We help low income renters find homes and we help homeowners protest their property taxes. So I, I heard you, Matt, and so I want to just sit, clarify one more time. So the 500 units, the one, the, all the ones that have public housing that are set aside for public housing currently, upon demoing and everything, they will re be replaced. The person that's in public housing today, when it's replaced, there will be a public housing. Well, because there is a difference between a voucher and public housing with the uh, with rights and, and things that come with that. So for every public housing that's being brought down, there's going to be a replacement. No, okay. because this is not choice. Choice requires one for one and provides us the funding to do that. We don't have choice to do that. So there's no way to do one for one or even two for one. 
there's just not enough money to do so. But what we, what we do do is do public housing along with Section 8 in order to provide opportunities for our families that want to stay in the community to come back to the new units, so, whether it's public housing or Section 8. And that is their choice. So out of the, how much public housing currently exists and what's going to be available for replacement? How many is going to replace? Yeah. So that was a previous question. We can't tell you right now. We're, again, we're uh, advertising for a master developer to come in and work with us. And everything, and please understand this, every phase, every single development is dependent on its financing. And when we go after financing, you know, as acknowledged earlier, it's very difficult. We've been at this a long time, and we're grateful for what we have right now. But we can't, we don't know what the future is going to hold for us. And so every development, every phase, how many units of TV subsidized, affordable, and market will be dependent on what we can get. So the problem with Section 8, uh, one of the issues of, all right, you work public housing, here's a Section 8 voucher, go ahead and find something. It's finding something. So uh, our nonprofit, that's what we do. We do it for free. We help uh, Section 8 voucher holders find homes. 2% of the market allow, uh, accept Section 8 voucher holders. So saying that they're going to be able to find a property um, where they are, if you're saying that if I, if I was a public housing person and I'm going to give you a voucher and then saying that they will be able to come back to the area, that's uh, Section 8, is, it's up to the landlord to accept it at that point. And so that, that's one of the issues. Where the landlord? Did you know that the affordable units take Section 8? Yeah. So it's not just public housing. When we build and we talk about affordable units, we take Section 8 budget. Then why not do public housing? Because it's a different uh, different subsidy that's received. And it's all, again, it's all, all about the math. How many deeply subsidized units can we support? And at what levels can they be supported by the other units? So they, so if I'm public housing, you give me a voucher, I can come back over here, my money's not going to change or anything like that. Your, your voucher, what you're paying on your voucher is what you're paying. It just doesn't it's make. All, it just doesn't section, make section a. Section eight of public housing is based on the individual's income and their family composition. Okay. All right. Well, then uh, I'll put that one to the side and wanted to add. Uh, so if I currently live here and then I'm being moved on to another location, is there going to be relocation support? Like I'm disabled, I need help to move my. Is somebody going to go out there and help them move physically to the next location? Absolutely. Absolutely. We provide them with financial support, case management support. We help them move all the support that's needed. And my last question is, so our nonprofit acts helps homeowners protest property taxes for free. So I just did a mile radius of this area. Um, majority of the homes are worth under $100,000 that are currently being sold. And so upon this revitalization of this area, a new development area came, has Saha or is there any plans to reach out to the homeowners in the area and see by ensuring that they have their homestead exemptions, their senior freezes, because since there's going to be a city-induced improvement to the area and financially done, so well then the community, the homeowners, to stop displacement need to be notified that, hey, do you have your homestead exemption? Because all of a sudden your evaluation is going to increase a lot more than it has been in the last two years. When we go into a community, we work with our city council person in order to get that done. <laughs> all right, I think I left that answer. Yeah, okay. Devin Walker. We said we need to be respectful, so let's be respectful. Devin Walker. I live on Salinas in Colorado. I'm relatively new to the west side. I grew up in Soto. Um, like someone else said, you know, I could, I could afford it. I got here as fast as I could. And I absolutely love this community. I've never been welcomed with open arms the way I have here, and I really love all of y'all. So thank you guys. Um, I'm super excited to see the opportunity for uh, increased quality of life for people, and I'm really grateful for what you guys are doing. I do have one concern, though, and we've seen it time again with uh, neighborhoods that unfortunately have revitalized uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an inappropriate manner, which I hope has happened here. But uh, the main concern is parking. You, you address 100 parking spaces, but 88 units, the majority of which are going to be two bedrooms. So the math isn't quite out there, add to the fact that we're putting a community center there. Um, I'm concerned about cars being everywhere, parallel park, limiting visibility, dangerous for the kids that want to play, dangerous for cars running around. Would there be any potential for maybe uh, considering alternative parking, maybe like a, a 
you know, the two two story parking perhaps, or maybe you know, can't build out, build up, or something. Um, you know, of course, with the design of the parking garage, I'd be mindful of the neighborhood. <laughs> so here's our dilemma, and that's a very good question because we heard it during planning, and we've heard it again during our recent meetings with uh, the Esperanza group and the Westside Historic Preservation group and, and Tier One. First, it was there's not enough parking. So we tried to include as much parking as we could because it is a concern with our residents and they brought that up as well and with the people living in the in the residential area because we don't want all these cars on the street blocking traffic but then when we met recently it was we don't want that much parking you know with, we don't want these big parking spaces so we've tried to redesign to make sure that we bring down some of the parking but still have enough uh based on historical information on 88 minutes, what would be needed within that particular community. So again, I want you to see, this is the balancing act we have to do. Because every, with, with every, with every um, individual that's in this room has a different need or desire, and it's very, very difficult to meet everyone's need and everyone's desire, but we are trying. So we're gonna go on to the next person. Oh, did, you, did you have another? To be, to be uh, participate in, in meetings. Okay. 
meetings and those types Outside of things, right? Community. Yeah, so I would point you one, there's, there's many opportunities to do that. So these folks here that are part of the resident leadership, they meet quite often. They provide a newsletter to the community. They host events. They do food distributions. They uh, bring partners to you know to to the community to do everything like sort of like back to school. I mean, they just posted a back to school. I've been volunteering for those for two years. I also Perfect. work in the San Antonio Fatherhood campaign, awesome. and so I go outside of my job every day. Um, community members have my personal cell phone number and call me at one o'clock when they're in a domestic violence situation or in a parenting crisis to get their kids back or to keep their children from CPS courts and things like this. So I understand that opportunity and I've been taking those opportunities for two years now. I attended, you know, I spoke in, in the last, um, um, where the, the last event that you guys just had recently on Saturday, I did that last year. And it was so empowering and it was an awesome opportunity, but all the opportunities that I've been given still have not allowed me to maybe sit at a table with a developer. And I was also on resident council and it was, a, uh, it, was, a, it, was a, it was an experience. And, and so I volunteer now instead of being on the resident council, however I can assist. Even if that means when everybody's gone that I'm picking up trash and I'm folding up tents, I've contributed to my community. You're a perfect example of what we, what we try to uphold with our residents, right? So, one is I want to get with you and, and Jason to address your personal issue associated with what happened with uh, Sapphire, right? Because we need to get to the bottom of that. So, yeah, to slip to the gardens. Um, in relation to sort of the, the future meetings, I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to defer to these folks, but I'm glad you're already taking advantage of the, of the other opportunities to provide resident leadership. And I think I do remember when we were at the education summit, right? And so that's when you, you participated yeah. in that. So perfect. You're doing all the right things. Thank you, ma'am. And yes, there's opportunity. Again, it's afforded to everyone. It's afforded to everyone. Specific opportunity to sit in these planning meetings outside of so behind closed door meetings. Again, Animal Colleges has um, these board meetings for all these different units. And I personally got to set, sit on the board as a student, as an intern, and um, it was part of my, my stipend was a part of those hours. We, we don't have anything that exists right now like that, but it's, a, but it's something that we can look into. We don't have a board like that that exists. What we do is when we plan, we plan with the whole community because everyone has a voice. Everyone has a, a desire and an opinion about what they want to see. But we don't have a particular board right now that is just about development. And, and I mean, wouldn't you say that's a concern of yours, that we don't have a resident, that, that there's not uh, official meetings with people who are putting these plans that are going to go forward with the law? Um, you know, because I'd like to see the uh, Apache board to come back and not, not an Apache law. So, so let me address the question said earlier. So we have a board of seven uh, commissioners. Um, they're all appointed by the mayor. Um, five of those are just private citizens that you know, um, you know, volunteer to serve on, on our board. But we have two resident services, uh, uh, two resident service, uh, uh, I'm sorry, two resident commissioners. Uh, one that was here earlier, Mr. Clack, uh, is, he's actually a resident. Lives on the east side, uh, uh, WC White community. So there's always a few, uh, an opportunity in the future to serve in that capacity. Um, you know, we, that's why we try to sort of build up resident leadership so that we identify people like Janet and others, right? So that at some point in the future, if that slot comes up, there's a potential that the mayor could actually appoint you to the, to the full board. At that point, then you're dealing with not only sort of the developer issues and all of that, the, the stuff, but all of the operations, resident services, and all of the things associated with Saha. So I would, you know, when I, when I think when, when Lorraine was saying there's not an existing opportunity in terms of sort of meeting with their sort of meetings, you know, sitting down with developers, that, that doesn't exist, but it does, it, it does exist within sort of our structure uh, with, the, with the board of commissioners. It's just that those opportunities, for example, don't come that often. I think our resident commissioners have been on for about three or four years, maybe. Um, but they do come up in the future, so there's always, there's always an opportunity there. Okay? Daniel Rodriguez. Hello, my name is Daniel Rodriguez, and I do have some concerns. Um, I had gotten a head meeting some years back in 2004, 2005, and what they had uh, talked about 
was going away from high density and going more into single family homes. Now, an example they gave was the middle school court area and building. It just so happens I did visit those places in the mid 80s. Uh, it wasn't under good conditions. There were emergency calls from different types, different surrounding area. But my concern with this facility, since it's on the way in, sorry, it's going in, is um, please consider stretchers. Does a stretcher fit for a heart attack, a heart fall, or whatever? But does a stretcher fit in the elevator? That's one of the concerns that I have. If you create a patch of elevators, that's a um, the, the high density for some reason, they did not, I mean, nothing against that kind of thing. It was nothing against that kind of thing. Sometimes they quit So, the high density, unfortunately, brought other problems. It was one of the issues. So, it just happened. Now we have high density. It is mixed income. That's fine. But, when we talk about parking, people talked about traffic. Uh, emergency responders do need an area to, to, to park. They also need an area to assist and prevent somebody. Now you have 80, 88 units. You have 88 kitchens that you have to contend with. So we can make mistakes. Another thing that's the French forgot is that it's so small. So it's going to be strangers. And what do people do? They buy shelves and they put their shelves. And they don't realize that the streets are there. Now, I don't know if you can have the three light in which you can be proactive versus reactive. Because I've always been proactive in it. But uh, be proactive in that the design is not uh, abridged innocently by the people that live there. Um, what I heard is management cannot just go into a place to visit their home. So in other condos of higher level, like on Milton Brand and uh, Broadway, you can't go into their home. It's their home. So that was, that's a concern, uh, not a concern, but an observation that I hope you all see into consideration regarding emergency access, uh, the ability to get stricter in and out. Uh, you can't really regulate of having people with mobility problems on the first floor because that could be a federal whatever. Uh, but uh, how to have an evacuation venue uh, for individuals with uh, some type of capacity work. But uh, that's one of the concerns, identity, traffic, access, uh, how to get people in. No, we can certainly look at that, but I'll, we, we will definitely address that for the emergency features. Um, every unit is fitted with a sprinkler, um, and so that's that's going to be different from the current ports. But additionally, the current ports, they, they, there is not fire truck access. Um, for hose lake in between them, so that's something that we're uh, the, that will be improved. It has to be code uh, for the other one, and we'll certainly look into the stretcher issue as well. With regard to safety hazards on 50 units, we can go into the units, and in fact, we're required to because of our funding. We have to conduct uh, inspections in the units, and so we have to make and that's part of the inspection process. And we'll get deemed if someone puts a bin in front of a window because it's a safety hazard. So we, we appreciate your concern, and we can address it. Okay, so again, we thank you for coming tonight. We ask your support on. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to say that the resident council does work very hard. Um, right now, we have we are at four officers, and we do have a new, uh, newsletter that Michelle, the president, works very hard on as far as passing information. We are the largest. Um, Saha community, so it is a lot of work as far as us passing the paperwork out to the windows. The information is passed out. Y'all know you guys were just here helping us pass out the information for this meeting today. Um, we also have a Facebook group of constantly uh, posting events and, and, and information so we can have that connection with the community and serve and hear the what the community needs and wants are. And um, we're here for you. We have our monthly meetings. I welcome you guys to come. And we're here. So thank you. Thank you, Janet. And we know that not everyone does social media.
and not everyone gets, uh, likes email. So you need to let us know what your preference is, is how to obtain information in order for us to make sure that you get the information. We're doing our best to get out into the neighborhood and to spread the word through social media and to do mailings. Um, and we will continue to do so. Would you mind introducing yourself again and tell me what, what you're affiliated with? I'm with the City County Joint Commission on Elderly Affairs, and I'm attending this so that we make sure that we do place the seniors and we don't do it. We make sure that they have a place way in advance. I'm Lorraine Robles. Robles? Lorraine Robles, R O B L E S. I'm the Director of Real Estate Development. Director of Real Estate Development. Yes, what's up? I'm Betty, I'm, I'm Jason Arachiga uh, with NRP. I gave you my card, Betty, so you got my card. You're welcome. So again, thank you for coming out this evening. We appreciate it. We ask for your support on August 22nd. We look forward to our future meetings. Thank you again. Thank you again.